Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We want to give you a warm welcome to our webinar, How to Go on Your Own Insect Safari. This webinar today is brought to you by Daily Axe, the city of Petaluma and Petaluma Bounty. We're so excited to get started today and show you guys all about our favorite insects. Um, before we get started, though, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping items. Um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please use the question and answer little box instead of the chat box to ask us those questions. And also, make sure you keep an eye on the chat box. Um, throughout the webinar, we'll be sending you any applicable links through that chat box. Also, if um, you think we're going too fast or you need us to slow down a little bit or you have an urgent question, feel free to use the raise hand function and Liz or I will get back to you. So before we get started, I wanted to introduce you to your hosts. Um, I am Serena. I'm a programs coordinator at Daily Axe, and I am accompanied today by your other host, Liz. Hi, everybody. It's Liz. I'm a senior programs coordinator with Daily Axe, and I'm so thrilled to be here today and to be collaborating with everybody who's on this panel. Again, thank you for joining us. So before we get started, I wanted to introduce you guys to Daily Axe if you haven't heard of us before. Daily Axe is a holistic nonprofit um, that takes a heart-centered approach to inspired transformative actions that create a connected, equitable, and climate resilient community. We believe in the power of our daily actions to reconnect people to self, community, and place, which helps heal our society and our planet. Our holistic approach starts with the soil and swells into culture and policy change. Through over a hundred talks, tours, and workshops throughout the year, we implement three interwoven strategies for systems changes. First, we spread solutions and models that offer the skills, tools, and resources that people need to grow food, medicine, habitat, and community while conserving resources. Because change happens through collaboration, we also invest in strengthening community leadership through our networks, alliances, and leadership training programs. And then finally, last but not least, we build public and political will by mobilizing our community's power for environmental, climate, and justice policies. As you can see, Daily Axe has done a lot in the last 18 years of inspired daily actions towards a healthy people and a healthy planet. And we're really excited to be here with you all today. Now I'm gonna give Harley a chance to introduce herself in the Petaluma Bounty Program. Go ahead, Harley. Hi everyone, my name's Harley. I'm the education coordinator here at Petaluma Bounty. I'm actually at the farm right now. We are a small community farm in the heart of Petaluma. We, our organization is all about growing healthy food for everyone in the Petaluma area. And we do this through growing food that is accessible and affordable to everyone. Um, we also like to engage with the community through our volunteer program. We have several different education programs for all ages. So as soon as this is all over, we gladly welcome you back to the farm. Please check out our website and our Facebook page to see all of our upcoming events. Um, but we're so happy to be a part of this community and um, on this webinar today with you guys and with Daily Acts. And um, good morning, everyone. I am one of the guest speakers here. My name is Candace, and I am um, an entomologist, which is a, in, a, excuse me, an insect who studies scientists. <laughs> I meant to say I'm a scientist who studies insects. Um, I grew up in the Los Angeles area, but I moved up uh, to Sonoma County to go to Sonoma State University, and I studied biology, and so I learned a lot about um, nature and all the stuff we're going to talk about today as part of my college and um, um, since leaving college I've done a lot of different workshops and uh, I love to go on hikes and everything like that so thank you Daily Axe for having me today. So I would like to know a little bit about you guys who's on the webinar with us so if you could answer in the chat box could you ask um, I, we're asking you to answer what is your first name, your age, and if you were an insect, what insect would you be and why? Let's see here. 
So Frankie, age eight, says that he would be a butterfly. Donnie, three, says he would like to be a butterfly and a bee. Axel, six, would like to be a millipede. Ray would like to be a butterfly. Estelle would like to be a bee. Oh, Frankie is a she, excuse me. Um, Cash, age 10, would like to be a bee. Naomi, age three, would like to be a butterfly. Francis, a seven and a half, he would be a box elder bug because it's fun. Great job. <laughs> Finley would like to be a butterfly. Jack would like to be a hornet. Desmond wants to be a worm. Elena and Kaya would like to be a butterfly. Alice would like to be a bee. Aurelia would like to be a wasp. Felix would like to be a bee. Oh, so many. <laughs> Anjali would like to be a butterfly. Finn would like to be a wasp. All right, quite a diversity of insects um, we have here. That's awesome. Thank you everyone for sharing. Oh, Sage would like to be a butterfly. Levy would like to be a praying mantis. Arrow would like to be a ladybug. Arlo would like to be a wasp. Kinsey, Kinsley would like to be a butterfly. Awesome. All right, so I'm gonna move on. Let's see here. So when um, I talk about insects, what is an insect? Oh, well, insects are animals that are part of the invertebrates, which means they have no backbone, but there's a lot of animals that don't have a backbone, like sea anemones, clams, snails. Um, but what makes insects uh, more unique is that they're arthropods. Arthropods have jointed legs and an exoskeleton. So there's other groups, um, other types of animals that have uh, exoskeleton and jointed legs, like roly polies, crabs, lobsters, millipedes, uh, insects. What makes them unique is their hexapod, which means they have six legs and they usually have two pairs of wings. I say usually because things like flies have, have one pair of wings and then reduced wings called haltiers, but usually insects have six legs and two pairs of wings. Um, insects also generally have three body regions. They have their head, that has antenna and compound eyes and mandibles to help them eat or mouth parts. They have their thorax, which is the center part of their body that has that the wings and the legs attached to. Six legs, two pairs of wings, and the abdomen, which is um, the, the lower, the bottom part. And actually a lot of insects breathe through their abdomen. They don't breathe through their mouth. They have these little holes on the side called spiracles. And that is what opens up to the air and that's how they breathe. And a lot of times if you see like a wasp or a, uh, a fly sitting on a, uh, a leaf or something and they're like moving their abdomen a lot, like up and down, that's, that's their breathing. They're, they're flexing their ab muscles and it's making air go in and out. What do insects need? Well, like all living things, they need food. Um, they need air, water, and a place to live or habitat. So for example, here at the bottom picture, those are mosquito larvae. In, um, the earliest part of their life, they have an aquatic life stage, so they live in water. And they have a little snorkel at the end of their bottom. And, that's, and see how they're putting it up to the surface of the water? That's how they get air. So um, it's just an interesting adaptation that they have. And so having a place to, when I talk about a place to live, habitat, that's where a lot of gardening comes in because um, a lot of insects need special plants or uh, places to live. So if you're going on your own insect safari, you're going out to see insects in their natural habitat. So places to look when you're looking for them, you look on plants, you can look in flowers, you can look on leaves, you can look at the base of the plant, you can look um, on the ground, maybe under rocks. Maybe you might see them flying or jumping through the air. It's kind of a colder day today, so you might see more crawly insects than flying insects. Or um, you could see them crawling on the ground. There's different ways that you can observe insects. You can sit in one spot and journal, find a, find a nice sit spot. You um, can observe them through photography, or if they're moving kind of fast to take a picture, you can do catch and release method where you um, 
take, put them into a jar or a Tupperware and container and have some, a chance to look at them up close before you let them go again. So a uh, little bit ago, I went to Petaluma Bounty and did a tour and I'm gonna show you a video where I talk about different um, insects that I found and different ways to observe insects. So here we go. Give me just a minute while I load the video. Hi everyone, I'm Harley. I'm the education coordinator at Petaluma Bounty. Welcome to our farm. Um, I hope you find some great bugs. I hope you're staying safe at home and finding some cool stuff to do at home. take my mask off since I'm in, have lots of space around me. Um, I'm here at the Petaluma Bounty Farm and this is a field of crops that are growing out and I'm going to talk a little bit about where to look for insects. So one place where you might see them is when there's flowers. You can see them flying by flowers maybe sitting and waiting. Flowers have a lot of pollen and nectar that are good sources of food for a lot of different types of bugs. Look over here. So as I'm looking at this plant, you can look at the flowers to see if anyone's coming by. You can also look at where the leaves and the stem meet. See if anyone is hiding in there. Um, on the, also, insects can be stepping on the underside of the leaves. There. Another place is where the um, at the ground at the base of the plant. Ready? Yep. Okay. So I'm uh, just looking around, seeing what I can find, and I notice that on this rock we have. Uh oh. All of these, these are ladybug pupa. So these are the ladybug larvae that crawl around and eat insects. And just like butterflies go into a cocoon to become an adult, ladybugs go through the same process. And so here they are settling on the rock and growing into more of a hardened shell. And then inside of that, they will wait and develop and come out as an adult ladybug. But this is what they look like when they're pupating. When I found the ladybugs, it made me curious that there must be some aphids nearby because that is the ladybug's favorite food. I was looking on this grown out broccoli plant and the stem is just covered with them. You look, you see all those little lumps, all those gray lumps. Each one of those is an aphid. And aphids are a type of insect that are considered a pest on plants because they have, their mouth is like a little straw and they pierce into the stem of the plant and they drink the plant's juice. And uh, if they keep growing and growing, they can cover the plant and make the plant not grow as well. But a little bit of aphids is okay. Like if there's um, balance between predator and prey, if you have ladybugs in your garden, that will help keep the population of aphids in check. Another place to look for insects and other creepy crawlies is underneath rocks. So if you carefully lift up rocks and peer at what's underneath. Oh, look, there's an earwig. And this is also, this must be Ladybug Central because I see so many. There's a ladybug larva, there's a pupa. There's one that's looking a bit more developed. Oh, I see ants and a spider and a beetle. On this one little rock, there's so many nooks and crannies 
that it provides a lot of little hiding spots and habitats for a lot of different insects. So maybe when you're looking for rocks, look for ones that have different types of textures because that could provide a lot of little different places you might find things. These are some of the optional tools that you can use on your insect safari. If you have a net, that can help with uh, uh, looking for insects, or you can just bring a plain container or jar. And that will help if you capture an insect to observe it before letting it go again. So I'm seeing that there's a lot of bees that are foraging on these flowers right here, so I'm gonna see if I can maybe sweep one up in my net. So if you get one in your net, I think I'm going to use the smaller jar. What I like to do is put the jar there and then use the lid to close it and then keep the net tight so it can't get out. Then put the lid on. I got a bumblebee. Do you see how they have baskets on their legs that they collect the pollen with? Bumblebees and honeybees have these um, brushes full of hair on the side of their legs and that's what they pack pollen in when they collect it, when they go from flower to flower. It has a yellow face and um, I know it's a bumblebee because it has a yellow stripe on its abdomen. I'm gonna let it go. If you have a net, I want to give you some tips on how to use it. You don't want to necessarily go straight down and hit the plants. What you want to do is sweep it over and then tilt it closed. So if you're trying to catch something, you sweep it and then tilt close. You can also brush it against the grass and see what, you might not see an insect that you're aiming for, but there might be ones that you don't see that you happen to pick up. So I'm going to try that. I got some flowers. <laughs> I got this little um, plant bug and a, a little, oh, this little beetle. It's called a weevil. It has a tiny little snout. Looks almost like an elephant snout. It's moving very fast. Maybe I'll try to take a picture of it. So Harley told me that there's a lot of cucumber beetles were a big pest at this farm. This is a cucumber beetle. It's green with black spots. And those outer wit those outer things are actually wings that are covering. So what they like to do is climb up to the top of a stem and then take off. See? Climbing, climbing. It's a cucumber beetle. One flew away. Are you going to fly? I guess he likes it there. All right, now we're at the orchard. And I'm going to look at the base of this plant. I got a dragonfly. This never happens, they're really fast. It was resting 
on the thing and my container was big enough that I could get him without hurting him. Look at those beautiful wings. It's a blue darner. He's got blue. Oh, I should I I wanna let you I think he's warming up. He's gonna fly away. Before I got distracted by the dragonfly, I was going to look more for the things that might be creeping um, in between the leaves and underneath the leaves. So. Let's see what we can find in here. Ooh. I'm looking at the base of the plant. Some of the leaves are starting to get broken down. I'm starting to really, yeah. Messing down here. Oh. Oh. Is that a slug? Maybe it's poop. I can't see. <laughs> I gotta wash my hands after this. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of decomposers in here when after, you know, after leaves are done growing, they need bugs to help decompose them and turn them back into soil. That's kind of what's happening underneath here. That's what happens in a compost pile too. Okay, so this is called um, this it looks like a spit right it looks like a spit wad it's like this foamy thing that's on the leaf that's made by what's called a spittle bug so spittle bugs secrete mucus and water and they they create sort of a bubble foam house that they can live in and it protects them so inside there there's a little larva Let's see if I can find him peekaboo so that little green guy that's the spittle bug. Okay. Let's see his little face. So here at the Petaluma Bounty Farm, they have something that's called a hedgerow. Here you can see are the row crops. So they have they plant the food plants in in rows that they can, you know, harvest and and rotate depending on what they want to grow and then over here on the border of the field they have all these bushes that are uh, perennials that are na uh, made of native plants and these are made to create habitat for insects and birds and other animals that will help with pest control so there will be different wasps and beetles and birds that will like to use the hedgerow and fly over and help out with the crops, either pollinating or eating aphids or eating worms, um, helping and benefiting the crops. So this is one great strategy for natural pest control is having a hedgerow. Here I am watching a rosemary bush, which is full of flowers right now, and it's very attractive to different bees. And I know bees can maybe be a little bit scary because some of them could sting you, but I'm standing very still and I'm watching them and they are very focused on their food. They are very focused on going to the flower. So as I'm standing here still, they're not coming after me at all. They're just watching. And I see a honeybee and I saw some carpenter bees buzzing around too. Right, so that the um, insect investigation that I did when I was at Petaluma Bounty Farms. I hope you enjoyed the video and got ideas of where to look for insects. And now, excuse me while I switch screens. Um, now I'm going to challenge everybody here on, the, on um, the webinar to have your turn to go outside you can go to your porch or your patio, or your backyard, front yard. We're gonna spend 20 minutes um, going out and you can uh, take pictures of what you see and um, 
send them into the Daily Acts Facebook page. I'm, I'm going to share the information, but we're going to come back in 20 minutes, which is 945. Um, so if you happen to take pictures, um, have a parent or helper send the photos on Facebook and we're going to put them all together. Yeah. Also gone ahead and drop the Daily Acts Facebook page link right in the chat below. Make sure when you send a photo, since we will be broadcasting them onto this webinar, that you don't include any photos of faces. Um, but we do want to see all the cool insects you guys collect, and Candace might even be able to help you identify a few of them. We'll see. Yeah. If anybody has any questions in the meantime, feel free to drop them in the question answer box. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a bathroom break. I'll be right back. Somebody said the Wi-Fi isn't good. I wonder what happened. I think yeah, it's st streaming video can be a little bit rough on uh, these platforms. So we'll send the link to videos afterwards. Okay. Yeah, I think Wi-Fi connection is going to vary with every webinar. Not that the yeah. whole world is using the internet. <laughs> yeah. Liz, you should totally go try and catch a bug. Okay, I'm gonna go try and catch a bug. Wish me luck.
We just got our first photo submission. Yay. Are you good, Candice? Yeah, I'm reading. I'm reading what Brianna is writing. Oh. I love it.
All right, three more minutes, three more minutes till we come back. Ah, okay. Okay. We're getting a lot of great submissions. So thank you everybody for taking the time to go out and uh, send us all of your amazing photos. I look forward to sharing this with everybody after our story time for the end of this webinar. Wow. <laughs> we have one more minute, everybody. <sighs> okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, I guess, because I'm gonna do. Mm, there we go. Stop sharing. <laughs> ah, where's my? I can't find my arrow. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just. I'm gonna read a story while uh, Serena and Liz are gonna get all your photos together and put them put them into um, a place where we all can see them. And that's gonna take a little bit, a bit of time. So while they're doing that, I'm gonna read a story. Um, someone is asking how to send photos to Daily Acts. You can send them a message on Facebook. And if you look in the chat, I think Liz put, um, put the link to that. I can go ahead and drop that link one more time. Other folks are also commenting with photos under our event page on the Daily Acts website through, Daily Acts, or through Facebook. Excuse me. So this is one of my favorite books um, about insects. It's called The Bumblebee Queen, and it's by April Pulley Sayer. And the Bumblebee Queen begins the spring below ground all alone. I want you guys to see. She digs out, she flies. Hungry, she seeks flowers. She drinks nectar with her long, hairy tongue. Here she's drinking. She begins to search. She searches behind the barn, beyond the lake. She buzzes around the bushes, between the fields. She's looking for a place to build her colony. A puddle? No. A bush? No. An old mouse nest? Yes. Now she prepares. She visits flowers and she drinks nectar. She gathers pollen. She makes a waxy cup, 
called her honey pot. In it, she stores nectar that she will eat on stormy days when it is not good weather for flying. She forms the pollen ball into a lump. She lays eggs on it and adds a wax covering. In five days, the eggs hatch. They're lumpy, plump larvae. No buzzing, no flying, just wiggling. The larvae eat pollen and the queen brings more. The larvae grow wiggling and chewing. They look like little worms at this point. Then one day the larvae spin cocoons. The queen bee keeps working. She collects nectar, she gathers pollen and she lays more eggs. In 10 days, the cocoons begin to ripen. The queen chews them open and the bees emerge with fanning their wings. Now the queen has helpers. The new workers gather nectar and pollen to feed the larva. Summer simmers, the colony grows. The queen lays more eggs, some form workers, some form drones and some will be the new queens. In fall, nights chill and flowers shrivel. New queens and drones emerge from the hive. Drones from many colonies zoom across fields, dabbing drops of bee perfume. New queens follow the perfume highways and they find the drones and they mate with them. Oh, I lost my spot. The new queens drink nectar, they search for soft earth, then they dig down and wait for spring. But the workers, the drones and the old queen bees stay above ground. They die, they cannot survive the cold. Old bee, queen of the bumblebees, won't see the next spring come, but her daughters, the new queens, will fly across the field and build colonies of their own. And that's the end. What I really like about that book is it um, explains how the bumblebees have a, a yearly cycle where each queen uh, starts building a nest on her own and then builds up the colony over the year. And then next winter, the new queens are overwintering underground, um, which is different than if you learn about honeybees, they tend to, there's a queen who stays in the hive and the workers go out of the hive and they can be perennial, which means they um, keep going from year to year. So it's, I like learning about different kinds of bees and their different life cycles. And um, so that's why I like that book so much. I hope you enjoyed it too. How is it going, Liz and Serena with the- I'm almost ready. So just okay. stay tuned for just a few more minutes for show and tell. Okay. Well, we had so many wonderful submissions. Great. In the meantime, does anyone have any questions? I'd also be happy to share my experience uh, trying to go out and look for bugs. Um, okay. I only had a jar. This is Liz speaking, by the way. I only had a jar and I found myself gravitating towards some of the plants that I prefer over others. And so while I didn't necessarily catch any bugs, I was fascinated to see all of the activity that was out there from little droppings that definitely looked like uh, droppings from smaller bugs to seeing some of the leaves of some of my favorite plants being chewed upon. And so I, was, I found myself looking intently around those plants to figure out who's eating my leaves. Where are you? How can I catch you and identify you? Uh, not, regardless, I wasn't able to catch anything, but I look forward to going back out there and taking some, some more intentional time to do that investigation. That's great. Oh, I saw a question. What does it say? Is a snail an insect? Oh, that's a good question. So um, no, a snail is not an insect because 
if you look at its body, um, it has a soft, um, it has a hard shell and a, a soft uh, body on the bottom and it's a mollusk, which is, it's more related to like clams and mussels and slugs. Um, it's an invertebrate and insects are also invertebrates, but insects have a, um, an exoskeleton. see. Oh, somebody, Noel, says that we couldn't submit ours, but we found a honeybee, a bumblebee, potato bug, cricket, lots of roly polies, spiders, spit bugs, millipedes, and centipedes. Wow. Somebody else found a big nest of earwigs, but they moved too fast to catch. Oh, yeah, earwigs are very fast. They, they're very good at running away. It's part of their survival strategy. <laughs> I'm noticing that there are some people on the attendee list that have raised hands. I'm wondering if you have a question, if you could go ahead and submit that into the Q&A portion of things. Thank you. One resource that I like to help me identify things is called iNaturalist. It's, um, it's an app. Uh, it has, it looks like this little bird right there. And you can um, submit photos to it and different scientists will be looking and seeing what photos are posted and it will help you determine what you found. And at the end of this, um, at the end of this month in April, April 24th to 27th, they're having something called the City Nature Challenge where cities from all over the world, people are submitting photos of nature they see in their, around their yards and everything. Um, and they're trying to get as many observations as they can. So. After the, um, um, after the webinar, we're gonna send you some resources. And so I'll send the information about the City Nature Challenge. Oh, I see. Ooh, there's lots of cool questions here. How many types of dragonflies are there? Oh, there's many types. Um, yeah, many different species. I don't know the exact number. How many legs does a millipede have? Well, um, I don't know the exact number. I think it varies between uh, individuals, but the Latin root of millipede, me, milli means a thousand and pede means feet. So its name means a thousand feet. So I think maybe that's an exaggeration. Maybe it doesn't have exactly a thousand, but it has a lot. Um, uh, what is a mussel? Oh, a mussel is um, an animal that has two shells that um, that is pulled together with and that there's its soft body is inside and it feeds by filtering water through its gills. So it lives in the ocean. Uh, a lot of them are like to be on like if there's uh, the big posts on the pier, they will attach themselves on the posts, and so you'll see like all these Rocks and they also live on rocks um, in the inner tidal. If you go to the beach and there's rocks, the mussels can be attached to there. <laughs> Why are insects called insects? That is a very good question. And what's the other question? Um, how do insects survive winter? Well, a lot of them um, stay underground. Some of them go into something that's called diapause. That's like a hibernation state where they're not really moving uh, very much or they don't really need to eat. They just kind of stay still for a while and they can really slow down their metabolism a lot. Um, there's actually, I know uh, my friend that I went to college with is studying beetles that live in the high Sierra where there's a lot of snow. He's studying how do they deal with winter. So it's a question that scientists are still working on answering. Where do ladybugs like to live? 
um, they, um, they typically like to live in areas where they live on plants and they, they like to be in areas where they can eat a lot of aphids. And sometimes they all get together in the woods in like huge aggregations. Some, and um, some people think it's for defense because they're all getting together in groups. Some people think it's maybe for mating or because they enjoy each other's company. But they'll have times where I've been in the forest and I just see a log that's just like covered with a bunch of ladybugs. And so I think they, they fly around too. What do roly polies eat? Um, they eat a lot of things in the soil. So they're really, they are really good at shredding down things. So they like to like live in wood chips or under rocks and stuff. And um, yeah, they're, they're decomposers. So they're really helpful in breaking down dead plants um, and creating compost. So are we ready to go to the Okay, show? Candace, are we ready to start show and tell? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Let's get started. You guys sent a bunch of amazing photos and we're still getting photos in. Um, so maybe we could show a few more at the end as well. I can barely keep up with you guys. All right. Mm. Ooh, okay. Ooh, I see on the log, I see ants. And I see, oh, it's, there's a spittle bug. The spittle bug on that buttercup. Oh, that red thing. I think that's a mite. A mite is um, related to spiders. They have eight legs. And then what's this one? Hold on. Oh, that. Oh, I'm, I'm looking at this one that's black with the six legs and it has two little spikes. I think that's a juvenile version of maybe a cricket. I'm having trouble making it out, but that's a fun thing. Yeah. Oh, I see roly poly and a beetle. Very nice. Roly polies are arthropods, but they have more than six legs, so they are not insects. Oh, a centipede. Oh, good job using gloves. Yeah, centipedes can bite. And I think I see a baby cricket. It's very little. It's going to get bigger soon. Oh, curled up. That might be a millipede. I think in the center, I see a millipede curled up. And then all like on the side, I see a lot of little things. Those might be um, what are called springtails. They're uh, little bugs that jump like this. And they're, they're little insects and they're really good at helping break down compost. They like mushrooms too. Oh, I think this worm thing on the left is a beetle larva. Um, you can see it has a head and then the first part of the worm, it's more hardened. And I think that's the, uh, I mean, the thorax where the legs come out of and then the rest is, hasn't, it's gonna turn into the abdomen when it gets bigger. But that's really neat. And then this looks like a pincher bug with maybe eggs nearby. Maybe uh, that's a mama with the eggs. Cool. Oh, and I see, yeah, I see a lot of eggs under there on one side, or maybe, maybe those are the pupa of ants. Those might be, yeah, those might be um, ants that are in their uh, cocoon stage. And then over here, we have crane flies that are mating. So there's two of them and they're put they have their butts together <laughs> they're like flying around together <laughs> oh i see a potato bug people also call them jerusalem crickets that's very neat some people think they're i used to think those were really scary when i was a kid oh and look a ladybug i see lots of spots nice colors Ooh, something under a rock Oh, it's hard to make out exactly what that is. It could be a beetle larva. And another ladybug, great. Ooh, I see this, it looks like a caterpillar. Maybe that's a moth larva. And then in the jar, is, is that a bee or a spider? It's a little hard for me to tell how many legs there are in that picture. But. 
I see a roly roly poly. That's how they have their name is because they roll up in a ball. So great. And then here is what they call a bordered plant bug. It has um, the red border all around. That's why they call it bordered plant bug. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you everyone for submitting all your pictures. That was awesome. Um, let's see. Yeah, thank you everybody so much for the submissions, for joining us today. Uh, I really want to give a huge thank you to both Candace and Harley for this collaboration and to my teammate Serena for helping us uh, launch this really successful webinar and I hope that you all thoroughly enjoyed yourselves and found some new inspiration and knowledge as to what it means to collect an insect or to observe and investigate an insect. And I would like to invite you all to our next webinar if you're looking for some more inspiration and another opportunity to uh, expand your knowledge. We do have an upcoming webinar called How to Harvest and Reuse Rainwater. We are going to be partnering with a local expert on rainwater capture, Jesse Savo, who is the founder of Blue Barrel Rainwater Catchment Systems. And I would like to invite all of you to that webinar. It's going to be next week, uh, Tuesday, April 21st. And then lastly, I do want to mention that during this time, as you can imagine, nonprofits and small businesses have been severely affected by this virus. And so if you do have the chance, we do want to ask if you're able to donate, we would greatly appreciate that. And it allows us to uh, bring these webinars to you all more frequently. And we really do feel quite fortunate that we have the opportunity to go online to reach a wider audience. And so I can't express our gratitude enough to each and every one of you who are on the call today. And what we will do is follow up in a resource email to send a, a version of this webinar, any resources that Candace has to share information on our upcoming webinars, as well as this link to donate if you are able. So again, thank you so much. We really appreciate all of you. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, if there are any questions, we actually have wrapped up a little bit early today, but we would definitely encourage you all to stay on the line and we can continue to answer questions that you may have. Uh, if we're feeling up to it, depending on how many people remain on the webinar, we might even be able to unmute some folks for a little bit more of a personal connection. Um, yeah, again, I really cannot express our gratitude enough. Thank you, everybody. We'll be here for the next few minutes. And if you are going to ask questions at this point, please use the question and answer box, which is the middle button below. Hmm. Ah, okay, here, now I see it. All right. All right. Oh, good question. Okay, so one of the questions is, um, do insects, do insect eggs overwinter and how do the same insects show up in large numbers in the same place every year? Um, so yeah, sometimes, they will lay eggs that will, um, you know, be waiting over winter. And when the temperature is warm enough, then they'll hatch out and come out. Um, and then, yeah, I think how they come out in large numbers every year is because they're either overwintering underground or they're waiting or they, they have, they know like there's their specific habitat. And so they either have eggs or larvae or adults waiting underground until it's time to pop out when the weather is good. Are spittle bugs insects? Uh, yes. Yes, they are. Oh, someone said thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Can we show you the tiny spiders outside? Um, Yes. Unfortunately, there's no way to share know. video in a webinar, um, but you can send us the photos. Okay. What can we do to support beneficial insects in our yards? Oh, that's a great question. Well, um, planting native plants is one of the biggest things that you can do to help support insects in your yards. Um, so the California Native Plant Society, has a tool called calscape.org 
and you can um, go to their website and it, they have tons of information about landscaping with native plants, like depending on what type of soil, your region. Um, they even have a page that shares about different butterflies and moths and what native plants they use for their larvae. It's like a giant page of all these different ones. It's an amazing resource. Um, another thing is avoid, um, avoid using pesticides and leave some areas that are a little bit wild. So if you have like maybe a pile of, a pile of sticks or a pile of leaves, um, you can let some of your plants that are growing um, maybe a little bit bigger, like at uh, Petaluma Bounty, there were a lot of those yellow flowers that's from kale growing out. So they were letting it grow bigger. And so that provided more food for the insects. Um, so there's a lot of different practices. There's a really great book called Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy that talks a lot about creating habitat in your yard, um, not just for insects, but also um, insects are the base of the food webs for a lot of other animals like lizards and birds and snail, um, squirrels and yeah. Mm -hmm. What flowers do butterflies like a lot? Okay, well, it depends on the type of butterfly. Um, butterflies can go to a lot of flowers that are open that have a good landing spot because they like to drink nectar. But then there's particular plants that butterflies like to lay their eggs on. So there's nectar plants and then there's what's called a larval host plant. And so that's what the butterflies lay their eggs on because the eggs will hatch and then caterpillars don't fly around. So caterpillars just crawl and they eat the plant that they're that they're born on. Um, so for monarch butterflies, milkweed is the plant that they like. Um, for pipe vine swallowtails, Dutchman's pipe vine. For California sisters, they like willows. So there's a lot of special relationships between butterflies and their host plants. Why do some ladybugs have no spots? You know, there, um, there's different species and some have a lot of spots, some are just plain red. There's an urban myth that the number of spots is how old they are. That's actually not true. <laughs> um, every ladybug that is in the shape of, you know, what we think of as a beetle is an adult. Um, once it's, you know, pupates, it's a larva, then it has in a cocoon. It's not really a cocoon, it's that little lump that I showed you in the video. Then once it hatches out and has wings, then it's an adult. So it has the number of spots that it has, depending on um, what species it is. And yeah, some are plain red. There's one called twice stabbed ladybug, which is black and it has two red spots, one on each wings. I think that's an interesting name for it. But yeah, there's, they have all different, different shades of red and black and different amounts of spots. Candace, I have a burning question about spittlebugs. I've been fascinated by them potentially my whole life. What role do they play in our ecosystem? Um, well, they're a herbivore, <laughs> so they eat plants. And I let me um, Google really quick what they become when they grow up. They're fascinating. You guys have had such great questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, they don't really harm the plant. They, you know, they suck a little bit of juice and they look look weird, but um, yeah, what do they turn into? They turn into something called a frog hopper, <laughs> which is um, related to the bordered plant bug. Um, they yeah they suck plant juices they probably provide food for like birds and stuff like that um let me see if i can find it in my book which is easier to share than my phone um. i have this really great book it's a photographic atlas to insect identification i borrowed it from the library and it has a lot of really great pictures in it. And it goes over, um, what is this one called? Hemiptera. Okay, 
So a lot of looking at bugs is like looking at the table of contents, looking at the index, looking, looking through the book over and over again. Um, it takes a while sometimes. Ooh, well, in the meantime, okay, we did get one more up. question. Um, what is your favorite <laughs> insect too? This is what a spittle bug looks, up, looks like when it grows up. It's black and it has some red stripes in it. Yeah. The book's not to scale, is it? No, no, no. <laughs> Probably a lot smaller. <laughs> no, this is a zoomed in picture, but yeah. There you can see that's that, that picture right there. What is my favorite insects? Oh, um, oh man, I have so many. Um, I really, I really like bumblebees <laughs> just because they're, they're cute and fuzzy and I, I really admire that um, the queen does all the work herself at first to get the colony started and overwinters underground. Um, so I kind of enjoy that. I also, um, just when I'm out and about, I just like seeing all different things that are flying around. So. And uh, okay, somebody asked, why did I become an entomologist? Well, when I was first in college, I wanted to be a marine biologist. So I took a lot of marine biology classes. I um, got hired to be a field assistant. So I was going to the intertidal a lot. Um, and then I ended up just um, having some problems with my schedule in college and I couldn't take certain classes I want to take. And so I ended up taking an entomology class because it was at a time that worked for me. And when I was in that class, I started learning more about insects and I started realizing that they're all around us. They're everywhere. They're in every type of habitat. Um, and it just got me a lot more curious about them. And then at the end of that class, my um, professor asked me if I wanted to um, do research with him. And he said that he knew of uh, somebody that worked at the Laguna Foundation that wanted to study pollinators of these endangered plants that grow in wetlands like around the Sebastopol and Santa Rosa area and they needed someone to help study who the pollinators of these plants are and so um, then I got I was um, they uh, hired me to become a grad student and do that for my master's degree and so from there I just started learning more and more and being curious and um, yeah, that's, that's how I became an entomologist. <laughs> um, but if I think before college, I, um, I really like spending time in nature. I did some summer camps, I think between third and fourth grade. I went to a summer camp um, that was at Platter Placerita Canyon Nature Center, which is outside of uh, Los Angeles area, which is very different. It's more dry. And there's a lot of like chaparral habitat. And I learned a lot about the different plants that grow there and how native peoples use them. Like they use the yucca to make rope and there's different plants that you can make soap from. And there's one that they called cowboy cologne, um, which smells really good. And so like cowboys would like rub it on themselves. So um, I think just going to camps like that and doing hikes got me interested in like what native plants are and um, how they're a little different than plants you might see in the garden and it got me more interested in um, habitat. So camping actually made a big difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Well, unless there's any other questions, I think that wraps us up for today. So thank you again, Candice, for sharing all of your knowledge and your excitement about insects with us. I hope you all walked away with an even greater appreciation for all the little critters that exist on our planet <laughs> and the habitats that they need to survive. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Bye. Have a great weekend, everybody. Yeah.